I see we still have people logging in, but it's great to see we're almost, uh, we're at 70 attendees already and, and still counting up. So welcome, welcome to the Global Swimwise Marathon, the first session here, and uh, it's going to be a wonderful day. I'd like to acknowledge everyone who's uh, online here, who's helped to organise this event, and uh, in keeping in tradition with Australia, I, I would like to acknowledge the traditional owners of, of the land on which we're meeting today, uh, recognise their elders past and present, and uh, and pay tribute to all of the traditional owners of Australia who, who work in the national resource space. Uh, that's something we like to start our meetings with here in Australia. Um, we have a wonderful lineup of speakers here this morning. And um, uh, yeah, and if you could please advance to that first slide and I'll just remind everyone what mode we're in. So, um, mm -hmm. so before we start with Aryan as the first speaker, yes, everyone's in listen, view and listen only mode. So if anyone has any questions, please post them through the chat mode. So um, we'll have, uh, Nicole moderating the chat session and any key, key questions will come up at the end of each speaker. So um, we don't have much time and we want to keep to to schedule today as best we can so we move around the world. So I'd like to pass over to Aryan here who will give the introduction on behalf of the World Fish Migration Foundation. Yes, thank you very much Lee. So this is <clears throat> quite exciting for us and um, it's uh, an idea that uh, my colleague Herman came up with uh, a few weeks ago, let's do a 24 hour webinar on uh, migratory fish. And uh, I first thought, oh, that's a really nice idea. And then we started on, on working on it. And then we realized, oh, it's quite a thing to organize such a thing. It's quite complex and with many, many speakers. And uh, one last week we were really like, oh my God, this is what we did we do. And luckily, Effling is, is arranged now and uh, we can start this. Um, first, I like to, I mean, with a webinar, you don't really see who you're talking to. I would like to, uh, to uh, have a bit of an idea. So we made a short uh, interview, a short poll. And um, if I think you can see that now. There are three questions and you can click on uh, each question and then um, in the end, you can uh, send in your vote. Um, maybe you can do that now. Can you all see that? Yes, it's coming in. And the first question is, well, what is it, what you're specific like? Fish, rivers, nature, or all of the above? And I see most of you are answering all of the above. That makes sense, I think. Uh, your professional background, we have quite a few students, scientists, policy makers as well, an NGO person, uh, somebody educating, and one for business, and uh, also other, of course, are probably things we did not include here. So it's quite a um, scientific uh, group, I see, students and scientists. And, um, oh, wait, wait a minute, I'm seeing that, but you don't see that. So, uh, and many of you try to share results. I will share the results, so I would do that. So most of scientists, all of the above, and many of you are planning to follow more sessions today. Quite a lot, actually. Okay, now it's nice to know who am I talking to. Um, then I'll go back to my screen. Um, sharing. So um, let me shortly introduce myself. My name is Arjan Berghuis from World Fish Migration Foundation director. We have a great team of people which has grown a lot in the last few years. Here's a picture of where we were in a dam at France uh, not long ago where this dam is by the way now taken out and um, and a lot of people have come to to join us as volunteer but also in the organization. The organization started in 2014 where we organized the first World Fish Migration Day because we wanted more people to give more uh, attention to give uh, migratory fish and um, uh, almost uh, yeah, in more than 50 countries there were 270 events organized. We launched the Happy Fish as a symbol of, uh, of, of uh, projects that really improved the situation for migratory fish and in 2016 we had the second World Fish Migration Day and we started a dam removal <coughs> Europe project. I will tell a little bit more about it. We are um, uh, heavily involved in the Amber project. It's a project where uh, in Europe all the barriers are being put on the map 
um, in, Europe, in the European rivers. And um, in 2018, we organized the third World Fish Migration Day and we launched uh, the second of the uh, From Sea to Source guide, something you can also download uh, still. And, um, and we're starting a global swimways initiative together with uh, the Cambridge Conservation Initiative and IUCN and others. And um, uh, in October, we will organize the fourth World Fish Migration Day. And in the end, we hope to organize at least or to celebrate at least one river opening per day. We have during all these years gathered a lot of contacts all over the world, around 10,000 people who are really uh, engaged somehow in, um, in, 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 the world, uh, in, in, yeah, in, in improving the situation for migratory fish. And I think that's really powerful to have such a group of people together, especially if you realize that with migratory fish is not going well worldwide. Uh, this is a picture of a living planet index. That's an index that's being made by the Zoological Society of London. And uh, it shows how it, the abundance of species is going. This is an old version. We will have a new version soon. And I can tell you that situation does not look good. Really grim. Therefore, we think we can learn from other conservation uh, practices like the flyways. People protecting birds uh, are working on flyways since 1930s already. Um, in North America, they were mapping the, the, the zones of, of migratory birds. And uh, that was a start of cooperation among the different people along that route to protect the situation for the birds. That even led to the convention of the Ramsar in 1971, where wetlands were being protected all over the world. And now they're organizing summits for flyways, where uh, government officials, all kinds of people come together to protect uh, migratory birds. And that is something we can learn from. This is a, a, a map where uh, the migratory birds, the main routes, have been uh, uh, mapped. This is from, from above, from the polar, so to say. And I think this is really strong. We really would like to have something like that for fish. And this is an old, uh, or, or an old version that we made a few years ago, which looks really nice and, uh, and, and we're proud of. But I think we really would like to have something a little bit more scientific also, which shows the roots, like, like with the birds. And therefore we started cooperating with IUCN, uh, UNEP and Cambridge University um, to, to start mapping the first one. And now a lot of, of our partners are joining as well. And we want to make a perfect new version of, or, or, or the first version actually, of global swimways worldwide. Now that's quite a thing, it sounds quite simple, but you need first a very good definition. What do you mean with global swimways? We had a lot of criteria, but currently we can, because of the data, we can only work with a high number of migratory fish making use of that route. And um, then we see that there's still a lot of information not there yet. We really have to work together if we want to improve that situation and want to share with more people what uh, uh, the, the data so we can make a good picture. And that is uh, possible. For example, uh, uh, we have the European eel. Uh, the European eel is, uh, is, is born in the Sargasso Sea, uh, let's say near to the Gulf of Mexico, then uh, slowly going to Europe, going into Europe, and then uh, uh, becoming big, and then when it's large enough, it goes back uh, to, uh, to get babies again, so to say. And um, uh, what is happening is that uh, this animal typically has many different threats. For example, in when they pass, uh, when they're young, Spain, they have to watch out not to become a part of the menu of people. Um, when they are really in Europe it, and they have to go back again, they have to watch out not to become uh, hacked by the, the pumping stations in the Netherlands, for example. And the good thing what is happening here is that now Europe, the EU, the official EU, is really uh, making sure that all the different countries do actions together to improve the situation for fish. That is what we are looking for. We ourselves have been active in such um, uh, activities where many people together try to make a change for migratory uh, species. This is a situation where I was myself 10 years ago as well, and also Herman Wanninger and a colleague. We were 
facing the situation in the Netherlands here, the, one of the biggest uh, dam in the Netherlands, 32 kilometers long, separating sea from freshwater, a disaster for migratory fish, as you can understand. And we said we are going to make a gap, a hole in this dam. And that's sort of impossible in the Netherlands, but we said, let's just do it. And we, um, uh, yeah, because we were so, with so many different people who had different qualities and different contexts, we were able to design a, a new concept and it costing 50 million euros. And now it's actually going to be built. So it is possible, there's a lot possible um, even if you think it's going to be difficult, you, you can just go ahead if you do it together. And that is the sort of the spirit we also got when we started with um, a dam removal Europe project, where different organizations like WWF uh, and, and ourselves, they, they, we cooperate to see where are uh, different dams being to taken out, what can we learn from each other, uh, where are other places, and we'd start to get to scale up such a movement. And therefore you need to cooperate and listen to each other and, and get inspired by, by others. And that's what we want to do with this webinar. For 24 hours, we want to go along the world and hear very different, I hope, well, I trust great stories uh, about what, um, uh, what the situation is worldwide with migratory fish, now starting with Oceania and, um, uh, and, and, and then uh, of course, also share good practices. What can we learn from each other? So I'm looking forward to the rest of it. And uh, Lee, can I uh, get back to you? I will stop sharing and then we can go to the next speaker. Fantastic, thank you. Uh, we do have a few minutes for any questions. So if there's any questions of that, I mean, it's a wonderful initiative, the whole swimway thing, understanding the fish, the whole life cycle of the fish and how we impact them is just a great initiative and doing that worldwide is so exciting. So Very um, exciting, if anyone, yes. anyone has a few questions for Ayan and, and just that global perspective, um, please feel free. We have a few minutes until the next talk begins. Uh, we do have a question right now. It says, um, how did the 24 hour webinar idea come to be? Ah, <laughs> that was uh, Herman Wanninger, he's uh, uh, my, my colleague. He just wake up in the morning and he thought, hmm, why don't we do an, uh, a webinar where we adapt ourselves to the dine zones of all the people around the world? Uh, because, I mean, if you organize what is something in one spot, then some, a lot of people have to wake up early or have to be very late. So we thought, well, let's just travel around the world digitally. And that's what we did. And well, quite happy that we did. I love it, somebody okay. says. Oh, that's nice. <laughs> Thank you. And we all love it. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Then maybe we can continue. If everyone's happy, then I'll, I'll share my screen. Uh, let's see, you can, uh, I'll do the begin slideshow from beginning. Can everyone see this on the screen? Yeah, very, very well. 300 years of decline. Okay, um, thanks. My name's uh, Lee Baumgartner for that. I didn't introduce myself earlier. I'm from Charles Sturt University and uh, I've been working in the in the field of sort of fish passage and fish migration now for almost 20 years. And uh, it's really exciting to be part of this and thank everyone for the opportunity to moderate the Oceania session. So uh, my role today is really to give a, a broad introduction of, of things across the Oceania region uh, in terms of swimways and, and, and the status and trends of what has happened uh, because quite a bit has happened over the last few hundred years which haven't been necessarily great for fish. Uh, I just wanted to start by introducing the Oceania section. And so this is, this is the region we'll be talking about today, uh, focusing on uh, Australia and New Zealand, uh, also Papua New Guinea and into Indonesia at the top. Uh, interestingly, there is fish passage issues on a lot of the Pacific Islands there, and, uh, and there's dams being built, and there's all sorts of things going on over there which are, are relevant to fish passage. And so uh, we'll introduce them there, but we won't cover them in too much detail today, but, but really focusing on some of the bigger islands in the region. 
I'll start with a, a map here. So one, a PhD student uh, last year decided they wanted to map all of the Australian rivers and they come up with this wonderful GIS map here, which shows the complexity of the different swimways at, at the continental scale of Australia. And, and I've inset there also the map from New Zealand showing the different rivers. And New Zealand having a lot of coastally flowing rivers and, and Australia having many inland flowing rivers as well. But the, the Australian context, uh, on the eastern side of the country here, we have a lot of the rivers which flow towards the ocean. So the context of swimways there requires a lot of fish to have a connection with the marine environment. But on the inland side here, particularly through central Australia, the, the rivers flow inland and a lot of the swimways are, are inland. When we head back over towards Western Australia, we have a lot of coastal connections again, but it's, it's a very big continent and the concept of swimways is different depending on where you are. And so uh, just a few general examples here of swimways and how they, how they sort of evolve. And uh, if, if we look at through the Papua New Guinea, Indonesian section, uh, sort of Northern Australia, we, we have migrations of some of the Icon fish here like sawfish and barramundi, um, which all have some sort of requirement to move up and down rivers at different stage of their life cycle. But interestingly, the, the fish are distributed across that area. So not just Australia, we also have them reaching into Indonesia and Papua New Guinea. If we move down to sort of the Pacific Ocean there, we have this wonderful swimway for eels, where we have eels that spend a lot of their time in fresh water, but migrate deep into the Pacific Ocean to spawn and their larvae then move down the coast and then back up the rivers. And so the swimway for eels incorporates rivers and also a very big oceanic section. Uh, we, we have some species of fish here like the grayling and the bass, which, which generally need to access the ocean and fresh water for different parts of their life. And then if we move inland here to, uh, to say the Murray-Darling Basin, we have Murray cod and golden perch, who are two examples of fish which exhibit both localized and long distance migrations across their life history. So we have a real diversity of swimways within Australia and, and that sort of Oceania area, um, which need to be considered in river development projects. Now they were just the icon species. Now there are, there are literally thousands of species across the Oceania region, smaller species which have swimways which might occur at a localised scale. Many small species of fish here, and, and this is an example of the freshwater fish of Western Australia. A whole range of wonderful fish which migrate at different scales, in, including here we have uh, number 67, here is the blind cave fish, which lives in caves, which uh, is, it doesn't actually have any eyes. It's evolved to have no eyes. It, it lives in, in zero, uh, zero light. So the concept of a swimway for that fish is very interesting. Now we have fish of the Murray-Darling Basin. Some fish migrate long distances. Some fish migrate small distances. Some fish are big, some fish are small. It's a similar situation in New Zealand. We have lots of large fish, small fish, eels, which go out to the ocean, lampreys, which go out to the ocean. And if we head north to Indonesia and Papua New Guinea, we have many of the species that we see in aquarium shops uh, across the world, which actually live in the wild there. And they also have swimways uh, at different scales as well. So you're talking thousands of species of fish across the Oceania region. Historically, fish were very important culturally, and uh, there's a lot of, of records of fish being the source of protein for traditional owners across the area. So the Maoris in New Zealand, the uh, Aboriginal people of Australia used fish, they ate fish. Fish were an important part of their nutrition. Uh, and it's still seen today across Indonesia and Papua New Guinea, people still catch fish using traditional methods and they eat them and they're a big part of their culture and their livelihoods. Uh, there's also now a very big recreational fishery. And so fish have this important recreational need. And so here are some examples here of, of recreational catches across the area. Um, Barramundi, Mangrove Jack in, in Northern Australia. We have Murray Cod and Golden Perch. Uh, we have, uh, we have here uh, whitebait migrations and, and also trout in New Zealand. And so these are, these are interesting migrations as well. But we have barriers which are blocking the swimways. Um, barriers which are creating uh, problems for some of the fish and uh, they occur at different scales. They can be as small as road crossings, they can be as big as large dams. And if we look at the context globally, we can see that between 1880 and 2005, there was quite a bit of, of big dam construction, particularly Australia and New Zealand and through Indonesia. These are largely for hydropower or for capturing water storages. If we then go to more recently, 
Uh, it's there's not so many a, a lot across Oceania. A lot of the dams have already been built, and the dams, that, the rivers that can be dammed, have been dammed. And there's not too many future dams that are planned. Uh, so the looking at what's under construction and what's planned is a, is a lot reduced. And there's only a handful now in Australia. There's probably a few more dots we could put on that map, um, which was produced a few years ago. But irrigation weirs are another a big concern. And if we look here, this is an example from the Murray-Darling Basin in Australia, and thousands of irrigation weirs which are blocking swimways of fish uh, through that area. And, and it's a similar uh, situation in New Zealand, a lot of smaller weirs which are blocking access on the coastal streams. Uh, and for fish that require access to different parts of the rivers as part of their swimway, it makes it very difficult for them. And that, that's led to massive declines. And here's, here's an example of the declines in the commercial fishery uh, for Murray Cod, uh, which started in, you look at the catch rates in 1947 and look at how much that declined up until when the commercial fishery was closed in, in 1998, big decline. And, and a lot of that occurred in response to the changes in the river because of river development. So there's ways we are trying to rebuild swimways. And if you look, take the Murray-Darling example, building fish ladders is one way that, uh, that we have been trying to rebuild swimways for fish. And there's some examples there from Australia and New Zealand on the right hand side. Um, but it's, it's not just enough to build a fish ladder to bring fish back because you need to make sure that fish have appropriate habitat. And, and for many years, we remove snags from rivers. Um, we've built irrigation schemes which now pump a lot of rivers, uh, fish out of the rivers. So, so that's another challenge for the swimways. Um, we have drought from climate change. You, for a swimway to work, there must be water in the rivers. Um, we have hydropower, which even if you get fish past upstream past a hydropower dam, they can get chopped up on their way downstream. And that's a big problem in Tasmania and New Zealand. Water quality is a big issue and invasive species is also an issue. And so We've been uh, working now on solutions to try and address them as a holistic part of recovering the swimway for fish. So we've been putting snags back in the river to, to make sure fish have good habitat. Um, we screen extraction points to stop fish from being removed by uh, irrigation and water diversion schemes. Uh, we now deliver environmental flows to make sure that there's good habitat for water to pr pr protect them in their swimway. We might have bypasses now around dams and weirs for fish that need to migrate downstream so that they can make it through successfully. Um, we are now stocking and translocating fish away from areas of harm to, to good areas. And um, we're harvesting alien species to try and remove that, that uh, impact on fish. And, uh, and across Oceania now, we're, we're using an integrated approach to that. It, it's not just enough to build a fish ladder to rehabilitate fish. You also need to make sure the habitat's good, that the irrigation schemes are screened, that there's good in-stream vegetation, but also that you're managing the impacts of what happens on the land, uh, because that does affect what happens in the river. And so, so what we're going to hear from the next few speakers uh, are some good examples about how we're doing this integrated management to protect the fish swimways across the Oceania region. And uh, we've got some pretty exciting talks coming up. So hoping that that, uh, that provides a, a nice overview of where we're at. So um, with that, that effectively concludes my 10 minute introduction to Oceania. And I'm very happy to take any questions uh, over the next few minutes as we move into the, uh, the next speaker who will be uh, Jean from New Zealand. Um, and so I might leave it on that slide there because I think it encapsulates quite nicely what the rest of the speakers will be we're talking about. Okay. So Nicole, if there's any questions, feel free to, uh, to push them through. Yeah, definitely. So I see two questions right now and we'll start with one and see if we have time for more. So I have one that says, have you been able to quantify how uh, barriers and rivers have affected commercial fish populations over time? And if so, have you been able to identify if any have been able to adapt by varying their patterns or behavior? That's a really tricky question because uh, if we look at that figure that's on the screen right now, what has generally happened is that we've, we've built weirs uh, to trap and move water. We've then put irrigation schemes in, we've removed snags, we've removed variation, and we've altered the river so much that to find the impact of just a barrier effect, 
as opposed to all of the other effects is, is really difficult. We do know that for some species like um, Macquarie perch in the Murray-Darling Basin, where we've blocked access to their spawning grounds, they've become extinct. That's happened. Uh, on the coastal streams where access has been blocked for, for things like Australia bass or barramundi, they have become extinct from upstream areas. And that's had big impacts in some areas on the commercial fisheries. So it, it's very, um, difficult also because in some rivers and streams we might have 60 or 70 species and they're all impacted in different ways and so trying to come up with solutions for all of these different species is a challenge and in many of the streams overseas we might be focusing on a handful of species like salmon or trout here there's so many different fish with so many different life history stages but to get back to the question about commercial fisheries, unfortunately, we've closed many of the inland fisheries here. Um, there's still inland fisheries for alien species, and many of the many of the fisheries for coastal fish are, are still in operation, um, but operating at a, at a lesser rate than what they were. So it's a work in progress, and we're at the very start of a very long program to rehabilitate these fish. Sure. Do we have time for more questions, or do we have to move on? We still have a few minutes, I think. We've got four minutes until Sean's ready. Oh, great. Um, um, but uh, if there's no more questions, we can uh, always just go to Jean's introductory slide. We do and, have a uh, few more questions. Maybe I can ask one more. Sure. Great. Um, we have one that says, uh, how can these barriers be removed if they were created sometimes to get hydraulic energy? Good question, really good question. And it, re it requires a, a review of the functionality of the, the barriers themselves. And it'd be fair to say that in Australia, we don't have a very proactive system of dam removal. I only know of three or four that have been removed ever. Uh, Jean may touch on this in New Zealand, but it, and it's certainly not the case up in Indonesia. They're still building barriers rather than removing them. What, what has, in a dry continent like Australia, uh, water security during drought is important and we provide that and unfortunately and as we'll hear, hear later on uh, in one of the presentations from Martin we'll see some of the adverse impacts of that so it is a big challenge weir removal is a challenge because you need the water and I do know that if everyone can be patient and wait for Martin's talk he's going to give some innovative alternatives for weirs on main channels which can potentially solve that problem. Great, let me know if you have time for more, um, otherwise we can move on for sure. Yeah, I think we might now, uh, Jean, if you could please share your screen, that at least will get us into the intro mode for yours as we're almost now within the last minute. So, and uh, you could unmute yourself if you like. Yep, um, I just have um, lost the ability to share my screen with something someone's just done. So we'll just work that out and, um, great and <laughs> it's always fun ah it's come back excellent so Jeanne is a freshwater technical advisor from the Department of Conservation uh, which is a public service department in New Zealand charged with the conservation of New Zealand's natural and historical heritage and Jean uh, is a wonderful advocate for fish passage and swimways and uh, we're very lucky to have Jean present to us today. So uh, Jean, I'll hand over to you and look forward to your 10 minutes. Okay, kia ora everybody. Um, I am really happy to be here um, to represent New Zealand. We've got one other speaker um, in the Oceania series um, doing that as well. And what I wanted to do is really highlight the coordinated approach that we're taking to fish passage in New Zealand. So first up, I wanted to let you know where we actually are. Um, so Lee already introduced sort of the Oceania picture. So we're this tiny little country um, down right beside Australia, um, but we have some pretty amazing um, knowledge of people worldwide that know us because of our kiwi fruit or our Lord of the Rings um, movies and our beautiful kiwi and obviously the All Blacks um, and then also we have some amazing freshwater streams and waterways so hopefully a lot of you um, can come out and explore some of them um, if you ever get the chance to come. So unfortunately our freshwater fish in New Zealand need our help. Um, there is 51 native species but 76% of those are threatened or at risk of extinction. Um, so that is really, really concerning. Over half of those need to move between the sea and fresh water to complete their life cycle. 
but many more of those those also need to move within our waterways to complete their life cycles as well. And an example of that is our white bait species down here. Um, obviously some like our eels go to sea to um, lay their eggs while others like our white bait come in as juveniles and lay eggs actually on the side of the stream um, and then those larvae get washed down to sea. But it's not actually just about freshwater fish. Um, our freshwater invertebrates actually need those passage as well and they can be impacted by some of our in-stream structures as well when they fly upstream um, trying to actually lay their eggs to complete their life cycle. So in New Zealand, we've got a number of different um, types of freshwater species and we've got a lot of small ones. Um, we've got our inanga, um, which is our main white bait species, so something that people um, fish for to eat as a little babies, um, and smelt, grey mullet and common bullies, so they're ones that really swim. Um, we've also got our eel forms, so we've got two um, native eels, and then we've got our climbing species, um, and then also we've got trout and salmon, which are our jumpers. So I just just wanted to, up in the right hand corner, you'll see this is our little, one of our little white bait species and they basically do like a gecko gait. They walk um, up if, as long as they've got a wetted um, area. The next one down um, is our beautiful lamprey and what we've found um, through some amazing work by Niwa is that just a straight edge like that stops our lamprey, but as soon as we curve that edge, those lamprey can get over. So those knowledge of the different swimming types is really, really important. So this is a typical freshwater stream catchment in New Zealand and as Lee pointed out we've got relatively short catchments compared to Australia but we've got different species in different parts of those catchments. What we've done though is we've put in a whole bunch of structures. Um, so different stop banks, weirs, dams, culverts. But what we want to point out here is that we've got different species like the inanga and giant kokapu down below that hang out generally down near the stream in the um, estuary and lowland streams, while we've got other species like the kawara up in the top right hand corner and our longfin eel that go all the way into the alpine areas and they can actually wriggle up 20 metre waterfalls. So we've really got different abilities. So for New Zealand streams, um, what makes some of our freshwater fish um, have barriers, those structures in the streams, is we've got closed tide gates and flood gates that just are too fast um, for, the sw for the fish to swim into once they open. We've got culverts um, and weirs and stuff that just have too turbulent water, they have a vertical drop, they have too fast a water inside. A lot of our species need that really um, small, slow, shallow moving water. And then obviously we've got overhangs um, that they just climb, can't climb up past and obviously vertical height. So what we decided to do is that we decided we needed collaboration and a national approach to fish passage management. So we had this amazing um, workshop back in 2013, which basically got everybody together that was involved in fish passage management. We realized that ownership um, and the management of our structures takes multiple organizations and people. Um, we've got different statutory responsibilities. It's not just one organization that's responsible. Um, and we've got regional differences within our guidance. So we needed that creative coordination and we needed some national consistency. So NIWA and DOC took on that challenge and NIWA is our um, National Crown Research Institute. And we had that, the goal of improving access to resources, um, creating a, a multi-agency national fish passage advisory group and better guidance and tools. And the two key focuses for those tools was national fish passage guidelines and also an assessment tool because we need to know where our structures are. So these are just some examples and we now have um, a website and some general information that people can go to where they can get that key information. So this is our amazing fish passage advisory group that's been going for a few years now. And it's a group of ecologists, engineers, environmental advisors representing those various groups. And this is who's represented currently on the group. Um, and the aim is to develop, communicate, promote, and advocate that improved um, technical knowledge and support the development of policy to support fish passage management and better connectivities of our waterways. 
So the advisory group's focus so far has been on communication, implementation of those resources and any sort of um, requirements like legal requirements, promotion and uptake of key research, actually getting people to fill our gaps and the creation of those key resources. So just along the page is a whole bunch of resources that we have produced. So we go from a, um, a kids advocacy activities um, to being involved in World Fish Migration Day to developing um, example factors sheets like the lessons learned which give examples of fish passage remediation to for specific examples so our national guidelines that came out in 2018 they focused um, on structures under four meters because they are the most common in New Zealand and generally structures over four meters require an individual um, guidance and management so this the aim was to provide a consistent approach it provides that um, better compliance with those statutory responsibilities it develops a process that people can go through when they're looking at fish passage management. It summarizes those legal requirements and identifies the minimum standards and best practice. Um, so we've got the golden standard, but we've also got the minimum standards. And it even has an appendix in the back, which sort of identifies the minimums that we could look at our statutory um, councils taking on into their plans. So this is just a bit of a real quick overview. So for new structures, the, the order of preference that we put in the guidelines is that we really like bridges. Obviously, if we could have bridges everywhere, that would be fantastic. Then the culverts stream simulation approach was your best practice example. And then we've got, we go down on, on um, preference from there from a hydraulic design for culverts um, to multi-barreled and our least preferred is Fords. We also have the nat nat natural rock ramp weirs that we're promoting compared to those traditional weir designs. And, and that's an example of those minimum design standards appendix that I just mentioned just prior. So the other thing is that obviously we provide those national guidance and minimum standards for our new installs, but we also need to consider our existing structures. We have a lot of existing structures. We have 120,000 plus existing structures. And one of the first things we needed to do was actually combine a whole lot of databases, which we're doing right now, um, to create a, a first up national layer to know where our structures are. The next thing we need to know is obviously how to assess them. So we've got a whole bunch of um, existing fish passage barriers and we need to look at improving them. So in the guidelines, it details some options for um, remediation. But generally when we're looking at any um, fish passage barrier, we're looking at removal, replacement, retrofit, or retain and build. Now that's something relatively different and it's only applicable to, to particular areas, but we do have some really important native fish that really can't compete with some of our invasive species. So actually what we do in that situation is we retain those natural waterfalls or we actually build built barriers in place to actually stop those invasive species moving into those native hotspots. So it's not just one size fits all. We have to watch what waterways and what's important in those waterways. So the other thing that we did, um, obviously, as part of that, and this is part of creating that national um, layer, is we needed an, a national protocol and database and assessment protocol. So sort of like the barrier tracker. We have basically collated all of our known in-stream structures, and now we've got a national protocol that, is, that can be used, so a consistent methodology to identify where a structure is, assess the risk to fish passage, and then it gets uploaded in a free app. So anyone in New Zealand, please get, get in and download this and go and assess any local apps of structures. So what we want to do is this uses not just observational data, it actually uses a whole lot of Bayesian belief networks behind it and it actually comes up with a risk score and also a priority to fix score. So that's my whirlwind tour. Um, thank you for listening and if you want to check out some more information on what New Zealand's doing, um, there's the website. And hopefully that's about 10 minutes, Lee. It was nine minutes and 50 seconds, so well done. Fantastic. So uh, we, we have about five minutes for some questions here. I mean, it's wonderful to hear what's happening in, uh, in New Zealand. So uh, yeah, we'll keep an eye on the Q&A window. And Nicole, please help us out if anyone has any questions. Yeah, we're getting some questions right now. Uh, let's see, the first question I see is, um, how can you build barriers for invasive species that won't affect native species? Can you describe this a bit? 
Yep, so we um, focus on the, the things that the natives can do that the, the trout or the invasive species can't do. And those invasive species actually aren't just exotic species, sometimes they're native species too, that have just got into the wrong places. So they've moved up into areas they've never been before because the waterways, um, it's warming up through to climate change and things like that. So the things that we focus on are that for stopping an invasive species like a trout getting into the wrong area, um, we actually focus on the ability that they need to jump. So we take out that shallow area below the um, barrier, we make that really shallow so they don't have that jumping point. We make it high enough so it's actually above of their ability to jump while we can um, stop a koara species getting into affect some of our white bait that don't go to sea. So our koara was one of our white bait species. And at that time, we actually need to put a lip in um, because koara are amazing climbers and we actually need to climb so that they can actually fall off. They've got a lip that they actually just can't get past. So there's a whole bunch of the, um, information on sort of minimum criteria for those built barriers um, that are in our national guidelines chapter. A few more coming through. Nicole, have you got a pick for us? Yeah, um, definitely. Um, so let's see. Another one I found is who within New Zealand audits the installation of new culverts and are these culverts logged onto a database for further analysis over time? Yeah, so that, um, so regional councils are responsible for um, processing the applications of new dams and diver um, diversions or structures, but also the Department of Conservation also has a role in dams and whether they require a fish facility or not. So both regional councils um, and the department have statutory responsibility um, and a processing side. Now, unfortunately, the regional councils don't have a database, and that's exactly why we've produced this fish passage assessment tool. Um, and we've then gone through a process of actually taking all these regional databases and combining them together into a consistent format um, that then is going to have that there so that we can actually look at them over time. Because as, as a lot of you will know, um, the fish passage, the structures become fish passage barriers over time um, because they haven't been embedded. Um, so so they become undercut and things like that. So um, we're on the we're on the beginning of this process, um, but we are trying to put the the things in place to be able to improve that management over time. We probably have time for one more, Nicole. If they, we're getting quite a few questions about whether these have been recorded, Nicole, could you just clarify if it's recorded? Yeah, uh, definitely. Um, yeah, so this will be recorded and the recordings will be available hopefully within the next week on our website and we'll let you know in an email um, where exactly you'll be able to find that very soon. Um, and then in terms of the actual questions, if we have time for that, I have some that more people are asking. Yeah, yeah, we, yeah, we definitely have time for one more, one or two more. Great, yeah, I have a few questions about policy, so I'll choose one of them, which is, how much work is being done on policy to defend streams from micro and other hydro and also to streamline the permitting process for dam removal? Um, so um, that probably, I'll start with the dam removal side of things. Um, at the moment, um, just going back to Lee's point earlier, there hasn't been a lot of dam removal in New Zealand. Um, we do use the dams we've got, but there has been some. Um, and Auckland Council and a few others have started with that, and there's some proposed in Taranaki and a few other places where they've been identified as not being needed. Um, so we are trying to, through the National Fish Passage Guidelines, we provided some guidance, um, which our National Ministry for the Environment is considering um, as formal adoption for minimum standards um, for new installs. Um, so we are looking at actually, we've been, the advisory group has been supporting that um, for formal adoption consideration. And at the moment, it's actually just going through um, government to see if it will be accepted. So um, hopefully Fish Passage, um, it will have better policy um, soon coming that will help it support the improved management. Thanks, John. I think that gets us into the next minute. So we might transition to Matt now, but thank you so much for your wonderful presentation. It's great to hear what's happening, as we say here in Australia, across the ditch. And uh, <laughs> good, good to see soon we'll be able to fly between our two countries soon, which might be a, a good vehicle for collaboration on these issues. So, uh, so thanks again for your talk. And we might, ask Matt, we might ask Matt now to uh, share his screen and unmute his microphone and I'll uh, introduce him. 
And I'll just remind everyone, this if you look down the bottom of the screen, there's two buttons. There's a chat window and there's a QA and a window. So please just, uh, any questions in the Q&A box, because we're not actually monitoring the chat box for questions. The Q&A is going through the Q&A. So thanks, Matt. Uh, if, if you click begin slideshow, that should show up uh, as, a, as, a, as a normal uh, sort of PowerPoint presentation there. And uh, while Matt's clicking begin slideshow, uh, I'll just introduce Matt. He, uh, Dr. Matt Gordas, he manages the uh, New South Wales Fish Passage Program on behalf of the Aquatic Rehabilitation Unit. Uh, within the New South Wales Department of Primary Industries in Australia. Matt was one of the co-chairs of the recently held Fish Passage Conference here in Australia and has been doing all sorts of wonderful things with Fish Passage in Australia. So Matt, it's hit 11.45, so I'll hand over to you. Good luck. Thanks Lee, just confirming that the presentation is up. It is, we can see that Matt, so over to you. Excellent. All right, thanks Lee and, and thanks everyone for joining in. Um, what I'm going to be talking about today is the New South Wales Fish Passage Strategy and a few of the challenges that we've faced within the Murray-Darling um, Swimway Project. So as Lee indicated, um, all fish need to migrate. And within Australia, at least, we've taken a whole fish community perspective with that. We don't just focus upon the big fish or the iconic fish. We want to be able to pass the small bodied fish which need to move, maybe not as, as far of a distance, but we still want to make sure that they can get upstream and downstream safely, as well as our larger fish such as the Murray cod and golden perch. The reality is that man-made um, structures such as weirs, dams, and road crossings, they block our migrating fish. Um, and they, they do a fairly good job of this. This wasn't their intention, um, but it's a, an impact that they've had that we're now having to, to deal with. And when we look around New South Wales, um, just looking at, at weirs and dams, we have over 2,000 um, barriers that have been identified um, within our state, um, all throughout the state. That doesn't include uh, road crossings or floodgates or, or other structures. Um, Today, just going to focus on weirs and dams, but our database has over 5,000 barriers in it that we keep active and that we're continually adding new structures as we identify them. The barriers that we have have contributed to a 90% decline in our native fish species, and that's a significant impact that's happened since European settlement. Now, when we try to look at trying to remediate or, or um, uh, deal with that 90% decline and trying to uh, install fishways or other remediation measures to be able to improve the ability of our native fish to migrate, we have some uh, key challenges. Now, there's many challenges out there. I'm only going to talk about three of them today. Uh, the first one is the, the cost of fishways um, and, and fish passage remediation. The second one is legislation, and in particular with regards to New South Wales' legislation, um, and also just how you deal with 2,000 plus barriers. So with regards to, to fishway cost, um, myself along with some colleagues of mine, one of them, Martin Mellon Cooper, which will be uh, speaking soon, we've been looking at, at really two aspects to try to look at driving the cost of fishways down, which has been a limiting factor in us being able to roll out fish passage um, remediation works around the state. Um, some of our fishways can cost well and above $1 million, $2 million. And so that limits it. It's not something where you can quickly find that type of funding at times. And so um, we, we really need to look at how we can keep those costs down. One option is we looked at optimizing um, our, our current fishway designs. And over the last few years, we've narrowed down the designs, at least within New South Wales, that we try to implement to three key designs. And those are the rock ramp fishways, the vertical slot, and the lock fishways. The rock ramps, which is what you see in, in this slide, in this photo, um, they generally go on weirs and dams that are only about one meter to two meters in height. Um, once you get to weirs um, and dams that are between uh, two meters to about five, six meters, then we might consider a vertical slot if it's a, a fixed crest structure. Um, 
if you start getting to higher barriers or ones where it's a regulating structure, so the headwater varies quite a lot, then we'll consider a, a lock fishway. And within each one of these designs, such as this rock ramp here, we're trying to optimize them. Um, one of the things that we're looking at is how we construct a lot of these fishways. So in this rock ramp fishway, we've used prefabricated components. So instead of using natural rocks, which might be cheaper than concrete, they're much more difficult to get the right size of rock as well as to place those rocks. And so even though the concrete might be a bit more expensive, the amount of time that the contractor has to be out on site is drastically reduced because he can just place the concrete quickly and get the right levels accurately. Another way of looking uh, at reducing the cost via construction optimization is dewatering. Dewatering is a huge cost for fishway construction. And one of the aspects that Marin and, and another colleague, Stephen Slark, was looking at uh, trying to optimize the, the, the construction process was instead of inserting a coffer dam that you're going to end up removing, trying to integrate that coffer dam into the design of the fishway. Um, Finally, uh, another construction technique is around uh, site batching. Um, if you can batch sites together, and I'll talk about this a bit later with the, the strategy, and if you just have one site and you do that site and then you do a second site, you're gonna have to go through various phases like design, um, procurement, and construction individually, where if you can batch four or five sites together, you can see, uh, achieve um, scale reductions in cost. So the next challenge that I'd like to talk about is that the challenge that we have with our legislation within New South Wales and being mindful that each jurisdiction has a, their own legislation um, that they have to, to work around. The way that our legislation works, and, and we're quite um, proud of it, and, and it's helped us to achieve some really good wins in New South Wales, but our legislation is really driven by when an asset gets near the end of its lifespan and they need to do significant refurbishment works to that asset. That is the only time when we can use the legislation to drive the construction of a fishway or fish passage remediation. And so I have on this slide a hypothetical example. These are weir, um, real weirs that are in the Murrumbidgee River within the Murray Darling system. But I put some hypothetical dates as to when these weirs will get to the end of their lifespan. And I have two of them highlighted, Red Bank Weir and Golgedry. And although they might only in themselves restrict uh, upstream fish migration to a small area, they actually have a catchment-wide impact upon uh, the Murrumbidgee system because you would have had some weirs that would have been, um, that would have had fishways constructed on them uh, maybe uh, in the near term, 2020, 2025. But using our legislation, we wouldn't have gotten fishways on them, uh, on, on all of the weirs in that catchment for 40 plus years. And so the swimway time frame is quite extended and it really impacts the benefits of those early fishways that are constructed. Instead, the approach that we want to take is we want to do proactive remediations based upon priority sites. And if we can be proactive, we can try to get our swimway time frame from 40 plus years down to something more achievable, five or 10 years. And that really gets to kind of the solution to the next problem that we have, which is that when you have 2000 plus barriers, and I used to show this map up um, when I was uh, talking to to various audiences and policy makers and decision makers thinking that this would galvanize them that we need to fund fish passage. Um, we need to get um, onto this straight away. Look at how bad this is. But I actually think this type of um, diagram actually does the opposite. If you have a fishway that costs one or two million dollars and you only deal at one time with one of these sites, it might appear as if you're not really achieving very much and it's hard to really see a coherent plan that will achieve um, fish passage remediation in New South Wales within the next 100 plus years. And so that makes it difficult for us to be able to really sell the fish passage program um, that we want to achieve. So what we ended up doing is working with a, a ministerial task force 
um, for the last three or four years. And we looked at the main swimways within New South Wales up to our major water supply dams. And when we did that, all of a sudden our 2000 plus barriers that we had shrunk down to 165 sites, a much more manageable number of sites for which we could try to get fish passage remediated at. It's a very clear message and a very clear time frame of 20 years to try to achieve this. Doesn't mean that the other tributaries and other waterways and other barriers are not important, but we kind of had to draw a line in the sand and, and provide this coherent message that we could then go to our policymakers and to our funding bodies. And, it, and since we've been able to develop this, we've had much more engaging conversations with them. Presently, what we're doing is we're trying to look at um, the first five years, we're not going to be able to get funding for a 20-year program, but we've broken it down, the 20-year program, down to five-year chunks, and we're trying to get funding through various means, various agencies, for the, the, the first five-year program. Now, certainly you can't do this by yourself, and so I just want to acknowledge the, the task force that was developed and been helping over the last um, four years to develop up the strategy and also colleagues, uh, especially Marin, um, who will be speaking soon, uh, Stephen Slark and Heath Robinson, um, who are key with um, coming up with new and novel uh, design features to optimize our fishways, and Lee with the excellent research that he does um, around the state and around the country. So that's the end of my presentation, and, and thank you for um, listening to, to the strategy. Fantastic, Matt. Thanks so much. It's certainly an exciting uh, opportunity and reinstating swimways at such a big scale. It's a, it's a really good program to be part of and congratulations for your leadership and, uh, and for all the work you put in for pushing this through at high levels. Um, certainly a challenge. So uh, we, we have time for questions. Matt was spot on 10 minutes. So well done, Matt, and keeping to time as well. So uh, we do have time for a few questions, Nicole. Great. Um, okay, the first question I see is, are the various barrier methods evaluated for effect effectiveness after they're placed in nature? Or in place in nature? Sorry, could you repeat that? Yeah, definitely. Are the various barrier methods evaluated for effectiveness after they are in place in nature? So, uh, I'm not quite understanding that the, the barriers that we're, that we've identified, um, we identify them through um, various, various audits that we've done. We also identify natural barriers in there as well. We don't try to remediate our, our natural barriers, but when we put in a, a, a remediation approach, a fishway, we do then try to go in afterwards and um, monitor uh, the effectiveness of those fishways. Um, we do that for a minimum of, of two to three years afterwards, primarily using uh, pit tags. If we can do trapping, we try to do that as well. Um, and what we've been able to find is certainly for our vertical slot fishways that they are working, um, that they're passing, especially our golden perch and Murray cod um, fish, that they're able to approach, enter, and um, exit our fishways and uh, within a, a few hours time period normally. Great, uh, maybe I can ask one more question before the time is up. Um, one more. Awesome, great. Uh, we have a question that says, um, what are the measures of success? That's a good, that's a good question. That's probably the million dollar um, question to answer is that the, the purpose of a fishway is to get fish from A to B, whether that's in the upstream direction or the downstream direction. So we can do our monitoring to demonstrate that. But really the, the biological objective of the, the fishways program, and as Lee was indicating, also looking at other options like re-snagging and pump screening is showing that fish populations are actually benefiting and recovering. So looking at that 90% decline and trying to get back to a 50% level, um, which was a, a, a key aim of the native fish strategy um, from the Murray-Darling Basin Authority. 
Thanks very much, Matt. I think that puts us up to uh, yeah, a minute to go to transition to the next speaker, who is Ian Cranwell from uh, from New Zealand. So, Matt, thank you so much for your insight. It's, it's as I said, it's an exciting program, and and we wish you best of luck with uh, the implementation. So, uh, now if we can get a uh, a screen share with Ian, if that's possible. Um, you please give us a hello and uh, we'll see Hold if, up. Uh, ah, we've got you. We've got a there we go. So, uh, yeah, so he's here. Oh. There we go. There we go, Leo, I'm all ready. Okay, flick back to the start and uh, I'll hand over to you. You're here today uh, representing your tribe and uh, it's the main indigenous tribe of the South Island in New Zealand. And I believe you also said you're representing your family and your ancestors. And we are really looking forward to your talk today to get um, some Maori perspectives on a migratory fish and swimways in New Zealand. So uh, over to you. Uh, tēnā koe, uh, Lee. Uh, nei rā, te mihi ki a koutou katoa, hi rau e ka mai i tēnei rā, ahakoa ki hia i tēnei au. Uh, mā takitaki i whakarongo ki au uh, te tei uri o, o ngaitahu, uh, nei anō uh, te mihi uh, mai o tautahi uh, ki a koutou katoa. Uh, nō reira, ko Yann Cranwell tōki koa. Hello everyone, my name is Yayan Cranwell. I am of Ngaitahu descent, uh, one of the indigenous tribes from the South Island of New Zealand. Here to talk about a perspective on migratory uh, fresh passage from coastal lakes, lagoons, um, with a focus on a lake very dear to my heart, Lake Forsyth, Trotua Wairewa. Um, um, Jan's already talked about where we are, but this is just a few pictures of um, where we whereabouts we are in the South Island. So this is our lake, uh, Trotua Wairewa. Um, there's lots of coastal lake lagoons along the south, uh, the east coast of the South Island um, and a lot of shingle barriers form on those lakes and, and lagoons and over time um, with um, deforestation more inland um, and the Reddit, you know, quite the inland of this, the South Island, a lot of shingle has ended up on the coast uh, and forming quite large barriers um, blocking our migrationary uh, fish. So this is, uh, I'm on the Banks Peninsula, this, this little insert here, and then you can see two lakes. One of the big lakes here is um, Waihora, and the little lake to the right of that is uh, Lake Forsyth. Um, from Te Pātaka Rākei Hotu, uh, one of the special places in the world, according to me. Um, this is my big house, our Whare Nui, so just reconnecting, and that has our mountain behind, um, and we connect to the landscape, um, connect to our area and acknowledge our, our ancestors. So that mako, the whare there, is, is one of my ancestors that I mentioned, that Lee mentioned before. Um, these are just kind of what our streams used to look like. You can see the podocarp forests in the background uh, grew right to the river's edges um, from the mountains to the sea, Kyuta Kitai. And this is out to the, the edge of the lake. So the lake used to be open. We used to use pa weir or used to um, put out uh, palisade um, into the water to catch our eels, but once the barriers close, as you can see here, um, the fish passage is hard for the for the not only eels, um, pātiki, uh, flounders, and inaka whitebait um, to migrate and also for recruitment. Um, so one of the main species for us here in New Zealand is tuna um, eels, and this is the life cycle. Of the, of the tuna. So Lee mentioned before, and also Jan, Jan's already also mentioned um, that the eels migrate to, uh, they swim out in about this time of year, between April and May, um, go to the South Pacific, um, and then spawn, and the adults pass die, and then the young uh, glass eels um, find their way back on the currents to the east coast of the South Island, um, swim up into the, either the rivers or the, uh, the lakes, and then the, um, the life cycle continues. So why is it important? Why are eels and other uh, species important to us? Because Lee's already mentioned that they uh, provide protein. They provide food and they provide food for us, uh, maera no, from, from many years ago and until today. So our traditions of catching our eels, and this is one of our eels represented at our marae, our big our place of gathering um, to show that our, this eel is a, um, is a kaitiaki or a guardian. Um, and, you know, this is what we do. So there's my tamariki there, my children, um, you know, and I teach them the process of actually catching the, catching the food 
Um, but also there's the reciprocity, the utu, that we have to make sure they get out and therefore their descendants can carry on. So while the eels um, um, reproduce, and so our tamariki understand that, uh, you know, if we look at after now, so when they have children, they'll still have something to catch and something to eat. And there's just a few photos of uh, my daughter uh, learning the processes of, uh, of, of pāwhara, um, splitting eels and, and drying them, and of course, smoking them. Hopefully that makes a few people hungry. It's making me hungry uh, looking at it right there. Um, so they come from, the, so the juveniles go up to the rivers, uh, they grow up, it's a short fin, short fin eel in, in Wairewa, they grow up, they migrate down the rivers, um, into, the, into the lake, and eventually they want to get out to sea um, and follow the process from the mountains to the sea, Kiutiki Tai. However, this is a shingle barrier. You can see the sea coming over the top. The eels taste the salt water. They want to get out um, and they can't because uh, the, barrier is, the barrier is too high. They can get up, but then the next wave washes them down. Um, so we have to come up with ways of, um, you know, how can we, we can get a digger in um, a digger uh, to, to do it, but we're trying to think more of a natural way of getting the, the eels out, but also the recruitment as well. So the recruitment happens um, in September, October. How can we get the, the inaka, um, the white bait, also the glass eels and the pātiki, the flounders, to come in and out of the, of the lake? So there's a, uh, a cheeky drawing of, a, of an eel. And there's, uh, you can see, and there's another photo of a big uh, female, um, that's a resident eel in, in the lake. Um, and you can see the size of uh, our fish and the, uh, the amount of protein you can sink in there. But also this big female here, this ufa, um, carries um, hundreds and thousands of eggs. So that is why we wanna get these females out to, out to spawn, um, so they can make sure there's a, enough um, progeny to um, make their way back to the South Island of, of New Zealand. Uh, this is uh, the inaka, uh, the white bait, which, um, as I said, comes in. Uh, as Jan's already talked about, it comes in in September, October. Um, they they grow. They attach their eggs to the um, uh, to the grasses on the edge of the of the lakes and the rivers. And then in the um, um, autumn rains, those eggs go out. They go out to sea, grow up to be form these white bait, and then come back in September, October, and the whole process uh, carries on. And of course, the partiki. Um, uh, the, the flounders. So there's a couple of ways that we can we can do. We can either do it the hard way. Um, as you can see, uh, you, you don't want to really use too much shovels because, uh, as they say, two shovels uh, two shovels out and one one shovel worth falls back in. So that's a bit of hard work uh, to try and uh, move the shingle barrier. Um, the other ways of getting the eels out is by um, using hinaki or uh, fike nets. However, when we've realized that uh, if we do this, it's good for fike netting, using hinaki is good for doing research and actually measuring the lengths of the, of the, of the species of the eels. Um, however, before they migrate, if you catch them in the nets, uh, they uh, put them, puts them under stress uh, and they need to, um, you know, a bit of time to, re to recover. However, um, you know, unless, you know, as I said, moving the shingle um, manually, this is one way of making sure the uh, eels can fulfill their uh, life cycle. So as you said, we catch them in the nets, we put them um, uh, in, the, in a bucket, and then we uh, let them over to the, to the sea down the, down the other side of the shingle. Um, and you can see here, a big, as I said, that big, uh, a big female had, can, had moved from uh, being a resident state to a migratory eel and uh, making its way, uh, hopefully, to the south of Tonga. Uh, we also um, thinking about this passage. So you can see that big shingle uh, barrier there. We've kind of, and um, you heard Matthew's uh, talk just before, talking about rock, um, using rocks and rock barriers and rock ladders, etc. So we thought we could try and uh, do that here on the on the on this big shingle barrier uh, running from the lake to the to the sea. Um, it would end up being about a hundred meters, um, and we kind of used we've used different material. We've used hessian, we've used um, plastic, etc. And what we've done, we've tried to get the um, uh, we've tried to get the seawater by pumping the seawater over, 
over the top uh, down this chute into the lake um, to make sure the eels can uh, uh, get out to sea. We've had some um, uh, success, uh, but uh, it's uh, work in practice and we're you know, trying to come up with different ways and that's, this uh, uh, happened to be able to talk on this, on this program. So um, you know, looking for some ideas. If anyone's got any uh, good ideas on how to get uh, eels over shingle, uh, welcome to, um, to hear that. Um, and so they, we have these barriers right along the South Island. So if we can work one here, we can work them all the way down on Waihora, Wainono and Waituna. So uh, what we can learn in this space, we can make sure we can um, use it in other areas. Another example we can use, I know my 10 minutes is nearly up, is uh, use a pipe. Uh, we could use a, we're thinking about using a big uh, PVC pipe under the shingle um, to see if we can allow um, fish passage. So we're working with Niwa, working with Environment Canterbury, one of the statutory bodies here, hopefully going to work with Department of Conservation and also Christchurch City Council um, to look at ways of uh, helping fish passage and, and keeping the ecological um, life cycle of the lake going. Kia ora koutou. That's me, Lee. Wow. Not only wow for the content, but everyone's sticking to 10 minutes. It's amazing. This is much better oh, yeah. than a normal conference. So it's fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> um, that was amazing just to see that the connection there with the, the fisheries and, and how you're working to save them. And so we'll certainly take some questions on that because it was a wonderful presentation. But I just had a question about the shingle barriers. Is, is that something that's common or is that something that's happened because of the changes in the landscape in the catchment? So, I mean, it was... Uh, for these, um, so one of one thing I didn't say, um, Wairewa or Lake Forsyth used to be a hapua or a lagoon. Um, so it used to be open to the sea, you know, majority of the time. And then over time with the, sh with the shingle coming down the major um, uh, braided rivers uh, in the South Island, it, it slowly, it's increased the barrier. Um, it sped the barrier up with, with people up in the central part of the central of South Island, um, you know, uh, with... Um, you know, more um, land activity, more shingle coming down the, the rivers. Um, so it's kind of caused a barrier. And those barriers are, so the barriers have been there, but the lake used to come up and blow itself out. Um, and that's what it used to do. And the name of our lake is called Wairewa, which means fast rising water. So it used to blow out, but now that shingle barrier, you saw the size of it. Um, the lake would have to be 10 foot high and flood everyone before it could do it. Okay, thanks for that. We had quite a few questions about that, so thanks for clarifying. That was great. Um, Nicole, do we have any, any other questions coming through? Yeah, I'm taking a look right now. Um, so I guess I think we have a clarifying question about the shingle barriers. I think most of them were around, um, kind of around that topic, um, but somebody said, so it's due to the changes in sediment transport in the South Island? Uh, yeah, so I mean, uh, if with deforestation up in the, you know, uh, the shingle, we have sedimentation inside the lake, and then that sedimentation, a lot of phosphorus sediment is causing the lake to become shallower, but the actual barriers up the, on the coastal side is more shingle coming down the, um, the braided rivers, the large braided rivers that form on the South Island, um, and that uh, comes down the coast, moves up the coast, because our predominantly south uh, west uh, movement of the of the coast uh, of the waves uh, moves the shingle up the up the coast and then forms those barriers um, in front of the lakes and lagoons. Great. We have another question. If we have time, Lee. Yeah, we still have two minutes. So uh, one question would be great. Perfect. So this person says, uh, "Thank you for these stories about the eel guardians and how you're working to protect them. Can you speak to how your community is building your youth capacity to become leaders and contributors in this work?" Yeah. So uh, as, as as I showed our tamariki, our children, um, you know, without installing in them our stories uh, and our, um, you know, we all love to have something to eat and something you know yummy to you know smoke deal, etc. But um, we've got to think about the, the future generation. So we try to install that into our, into our children um, to, to educate them about the stories, about the being the guardians. So we have the, the tuna is our guardian, but we are also the guardians of the tuna. Um, so our, it's our responsibility to make sure um, that there is um, enough for the next generation, sustainable uh, food source 
um, not only for us now, but for our children to come and also learning the stories that go with it. Fantastic. That's, uh, that's 15 minutes. That's 15 wonderful minutes. Thank you so much for the presentation and putting the effort into that and, and allowing us to understand the traditional and the Maori perspectives. It's so great to, to get that side of things. Um, really Nordale. interesting. And we've got lots of positive comments on your talks as well. So thank you so uh, much. Noreira, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, a tēnā tata katoa. Māori ora. Thank you. So we have our next speaker now, who's uh, Professor Martin Mallon Cooper. Uh, he's a prof professor who researches fish migration, fish behaviour and fish swimming abilities and uh, he's a director of the Australian not-for-profit organisation Ausfish and he also works uh, for Charles Sturt University and, and he owns his own consultancy, Fishway Consulting Services Australia. So um, we might uh, see if Martin you can share your screen and unmute your, uh, unmute your microphone. Uh, we might have to get Ian to unshare his screen. First, video, if, that, if that's possible, start your video, Martin. Thank you. And then the bottom, you should have a button, a green button that says share screen. Excellent. You cannot start screen share. Uh, that's might so need good. to. Uh... Okay, it's, it's... I'm starting to share. You, it still says, you, Lee, you cannot start screen share while the other participant is sharing. Ah, okay. we, we may, there we go. It should be okay now, Martin. Thank you. Okay, this is looking better. And I'll just uh, you see that. Give it a few seconds to show up. Here we go, Martin Mallencouver has started screen sharing. And there we go. Uh, we can see it, but you can only see a desktop. There's a wonderful picture of you on a mountain with Jane, your wife. <laughs> so. Okay, we, we, we might start with a talk then. <laughs> okay. There um, we go, fantastic. I'll hand over to you, Martin. The, the, the floor is yours, you, thank you. You can read that? We can, all, all yours. Okay. Uh, okay, thanks, Lee. Thanks very much to the organisers. I think uh, a global webinar is a fantastic idea. So I'm going to talk about the Darling River catastrophe. And what I'm talking about here is the fish kills that occurred in 2018, 2019, and uh, you know, whether we can fix it. So the Darling River is in southeastern Australia. It's a semi-arid river. It has periods of uh, long periods of base flows, it has floods, and has some short periods of zero flow. We've had some tagged fish migrating over 2,000 kilometres within the Darling River, obviously when there's flow. And there are about 20 fish species here, and Lee and Matt have spoken about them. And they sort of move to spawn, seek habitat, and disperse after droughts. But what happened in 2018, 2019, was massive fish kills, especially in the Lower Darling. This shocked uh, the indigenous communities, it shocked all river communities, and shocked the nation that we could, uh, you know, that this could you know, happen. So the causes of those fish kills were pretty clear. There was zero flow at the time, there was very hot weather. What happened was there was stratification, blue-green algae, very low dissolved oxygen, then that anoxic layer mixed and there were dead fish. So those causes are well known. So what about rehabilitation? And the rehabilitation, the discussion and the narrative is around these three things, providing fishways, flow, restocking threatened species. But there's another factor that's been overlooked and it's river hydraulics. This will underpin all rehabilitation or needs to underpin all rehabilitation in the Darling. It will determine whether the Darling gets better or worse. And so let me expand a bit on that, on river hydraulics. First of all, it incorporates fish passage, it incorporates flow, but it incorporates the shape of the river as well. River hydraulics is, in terms of river ecology, we have these two categories, flowing water, loading habitats and still water. So flowing water, is the thing that we uh, that gets lost when we have dams and weirs. So, so let me expand a bit on flowing water. And there are some very 
you know, specific functions that flowing water performs. For, for fish, fish passage, and we're talking about often here about fish migration, it provides downstream passage of drifting larvae. Those larvae settle into slack waters and other areas, and those areas are really key nursery habitats. So flowing water gives us hydraulic diversity as well. So there's another aspect to here for the darling, is it is the primary mitigation against blue-green algae. So drifting, uh, those species that have drifting larvae are uh, quite large species, golden perch, silver perch, Murray cod, uh, they're, they're key species in the ecology of this river system. So I want you to keep that perspective of flowing water and those functions as we return to the Darling River fish kills. <clears throat> so this was in the middle of one of the worst droughts on record. But the Darling has had droughts before. So if we go back to the period <clears throat> before the dams, before 1950, a colleague, Brendan Zampetti and I, looked at what the dams and what the droughts were like in this period. And in fact, what you find, even though there were droughts, there were high natural base flows. And there was flowing water, those lotic habitats, 70% of the time. So that provides easy upstream migration and easy downstream migration of drifting larvae. So when we look at droughts in the last 20 years, and now we have dams, we have irrigation, the river looks completely different and the base flows are extremely low. Pools and still water dominate and the flowing water now is reduced to 35% of the time. So one of the major causes of course are these upstream dams, they capture 70% of the flow. But down on the Darling River, when there was zero flow for 13 months and there were fish kills occurring, upstream, coming into the river was 10,000 megalitres a day, but there was still zero downstream. So there was another impact. And that impact are these low level weirs. So along the Darling, there are 17 weirs. They've been built for you know, over 120 years. And they operate like this. This is in fact that same weir, Burke weir. So in a drought, they look like this. Zero flow downstream, the upstream's been pumped out for town water. If rainfall occurs and inflow comes in, the weir partly fills, but there's zero flow downstream. So in a drought, this is occurring up and down the river. Here's a profile of the Darling River with 17 weirs. And the blue water, those blue lines are where flowing water remains between the weir pools. So 40% of the Darling River are weir pools or capturing flow in a drought. There's another impact of those weirs. Now I spoke about drifting larvae, but what happens when they hit a weir pool is they drop out. It's not very good habitat for many larvae. So this is a hydraulic barrier for downstream passage. And the weirs also provide a deeper pool and so we're increasing risk of stratification and blue-green algae. So our usual response to rehabilitation is to provide upstream passage, but we still have hydraulic barrier, we still have the risk of blue-green algae. So what we need to do is rationalise those weirs. And in fact, what we need to do is remove some of them and recreate some of that flame water, increase the base flows, then we'll have this life cycle, these nursery habitats reappearing. So this is also the primary mitigation. If we have more flame water, we have less opportunities for blue-green algae. So this sounds like a win-win. But those weirs provide critical town water supplies. So what then are the solutions? Well, one proven solution is off-stream storage. Now, there's an advantage to this because you can pump from the river into the off-stream storage when the river's high. You can also cover the off-stream storage to pre prevent evaporation. And if you feel more innovative, you can add floating solar panels. So generate electricity and have less evaporation. So there is a project to rationalise these weirs and it's called Western Weirs Project. And there's no, nothing firm at the moment, there's nothing on, on the table, there's just a bunch of options. So really we have a complete spectrum of options uh, at the moment for the Darling. And it will determine, as I say, whether the Darling improves or doesn't. At one end, we could have more weirs and in fact more fish waste. So imagine the Darling 
as a series of weirs, but now you can tell we've lost that fine water habitat. So we'll have less larval drift, less nursery habitats, fundamentally less fish. We may have a situation with more fishways, but fundamentally less fish. But that's just at one end of the spectrum. If we look at the other end, we could have off-stream storage, less weirs, more base flows, restoring long reaches of river of flowing water. And that will start to restore the ecosystem. This will recreate a resilient ecosystem and it re recreates the resilient river communities. Those communities have been in droughts, but part of being a resilient river community is not having dead fish flow past. So this is, this is a fantastic opportunity to re, you know, restore the Darling River, to you know, re, sort of restore those fish populations and really help those regional communities. So I have two take home messages. One, river hydraulics, it's fundamental to provide flowing water, we need it for downstream passage where there's drifting larvae and it is fundamental to restoring river ecosystem function. And the second one is the Darling River is utterly dependent on rehabilitating river hydraulics completely. Part of that is restoring base flows, connecting tributary flows and managing weirs. So I'd like to thank you very much uh, for listening and uh, I'll leave it there for questions. Thanks so much, Martin. A wonderful and different perspective on a very complex system. Um, a lot of people complimenting you on your array of fishing rods in the background, by the way. So um, whilst we look at them, I can anyway, we transition and ask Martin some questions about that. That's a, that's a really interesting talk because you know, fish passage is more than about fish ladders and swimways uh, are as much about uh, as much about the hydraulic situation, the habitat, as it is about making sure fish can go up and down. So uh, Nicole, do we have any any questions there? We do, yes, um, quite a few actually. So one of them is, how much water does agriculture and horticulture take from the Murray Darling catchment? Okay, well, uh, in a drought, in short periods of time, it'll, it will take 100%. You can actually, at the downstream end, have in the entire Murray Darling Basin, you can have zero flow. Um, obviously in the flood, it's a lot less. There's a plan called the Basin Plan, which is uh, the intent is to divide the water up. So there's 80% for agriculture and 20% for the environment. Thanks, Martin. Uh, we have time for, for one or two more quick questions, Nicole. Perfect. Uh, one of them is, is the blue-green algae due to flow primarily or is it due to interaction between invasive carp, nutrient pollution and flow? Can carp be eradicated during these very low flow periods? Wow, what an awesome question. <laughs> uh, look, yes, look, there, there, there are lots of work around algae. Nutrients is huge. Heat, light is huge. So, so we had a hot summer and we do have high nutrients. There's a lot of agricultural um, and production and it's about hydraulics, it's about, about flowing water as well. So controlling nutrients is part of the picture. Uh, carp is also part of the picture and uh, there's a bigger program around that. And right now, uh, we can't eradicate carp, but there is work on a virus to eradicate the carp, and um, I think that work's progressing. And yeah, we do have time for one more, Nicole. Okay, perfect. Um, here's a question that says, will there be policy changes to manage water takes from the river, possibly? Oh, sorry, what was that? Is that so oh, yeah. Uh, it says, will there be policy changes to manage water takes from the river, possibly? Uh, yes, I, 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 think that, I think there will be. I mean, actually, since that fish kill, I, I think a lot of people um, look at how they manage uh, water and, uh, and, and those tanks from the river and pumping from the river. There are, there are water sharing plans and very specific rules around that, but they're being reviewed. They get reviewed every five years. Um, absolutely, we, we do not manage the river well at the moment in droughts. When there's plenty of water around, it's uh, okay. But the rules around it in droughts, the river actually needs quite small quantities of water and, and even uh, small users have a big impact at that time. 
Okay, well, thanks again, Martin. It, it was a, a wonderful talk, a, a nice perspective on the Darling, and we hope that, uh, I mean, that, that captured worldwide headlines uh, when that fish kill event occurred, and, and it's going to be a big body of work to turn it around. So so thanks so much for sharing your perspective on the future of the of the Darling River, which is one of the icons of Australia. So. Okay, uh, we're, we're now transitioning into our final talk of the session, so thanks so much for, for sticking with us. We have had... Uh, We've been touching on 200, going over and under 200 participants for the whole session, uh, which has been fantastic. So thanks so much to everyone for, for being patient and logging, uh, logging in and, and joining the discussions. We now have a presentation from uh, Dr. Arif Waboa. So Arif, could you please unmute your microphone, please? I see you're muted there. Um, we could... Unmute you. So, so we're, we're going to swing north now and we're going to transition into the next session, uh, which is focusing on, on East Asia and uh, New Guinea and, and Indonesia uh, are sort of that area that where we transition out of the Australasian fish fauna and we move into this, uh, this Indo-Pacific type of fish fauna. And, uh, and Arif today is going to give us a talk about that transition uh, from the south to the north and give us a perspective on uh, on his wonderful country of Indonesia. So, Arif, could you please uh, hit the share screen at the bottom and uh, we will hand yeah. over to you. Thank you, Lee, I'm trying to open. Uh, we did see it up there a few minutes ago. Yes. It may take a, here we go. Yeah. So up the top of the slideshow, if you could click, click begin slideshow. Uh, we should be able to hand over yes. to you. Can there you we see? Go. Okay. We can, Arif. I, I will hide my video now and turn off my microphone. And uh, the floor is yours for ten minutes. Thank you so much. Okay. Thank you so much, Lee, and thank you so much, the organizer, to give me this opportunity. I'm really happy to speak about the inland fisheries in Indonesia. And just Lee mentioned, in Indonesia, is still going. Uh, lot of development, including the dam development for hydropower dam, at least now the hydropower dam 10% of the total energy for Indonesia. And I'm happy that we're going to start to initiate the Indonesia Peace Passage project for the next uh, four years, really. I began the PowerPoint with the small introduction about the, the inland fisheries. So it's about uh, 11 million ton fish scout globally come from inland fisheries and 90% of it come from developing country and among the five major production production of inland fisheries come from Southeast Asia country and this link to give benefit to 60 million people in the region. The inland fisheries characteristic is kind of unique. We seem like a subsistence fisheries, meaning they catch the fish daily, and after they catch the fish, they consume instantly, or maybe they, they go to the fish market, they sell the fish. So this kind of, of unique, and no, almost no commercial, commercial fishing happen in inland fisheries. The importance of inland fisheries, of course, is food security and nutrition. Nutrition meaning like for people in the rural area, they use calcium and micronutrient. This is very important as the government of Indonesia program to combat the stunting program and the inland fisheries can contribute significant to, to, to this agenda. And also the inland fisheries as a livelihood and cultural heritage. This is the last resort when the harvest fail. People just go to the back yard and they're just fishing the fish and they can have the protein on it. The next slide will be the water body of Southeast Asia as a, a tough, uh, the major production of inland fisheries in the world and also this is the production among the, the people in the Southeast Asia country and for Indonesia inland fisheries comprise from lake, reservoir, river, and plant plain, with uh, quite uh, a number amount of uh, this area. Especially for estuary and swamp, it's comprised of 9.5 million, so it's kind of a huge uh, area for inland water. 
the distribution of inland area, inland water area in Indonesia, is uh, in the five major island, and then Borneo Island is the biggest, with uh, constitute around 65% of it. And this is the Indonesia River Basin. Like we have like a 90 river basin unit. The number of river more than 5,000 and more than 60,000 tributaries, very interesting. And also the distribution of the lakes, small lake, reservoir, all is scattered all, on, all over Indonesia, but for reservoir, 70% of it uh, lies in the, in the Java Island. This is a new thing because the inland fisheries is quite a specific and it's really difficult to manage. So the government of Indonesia now issue a decree about the management area, unit management area for, fish, for fisheries management for inland fisheries. This is like a 14 fish management area. And all the resource management is going to be based on this area like uh, this restocking, this sanctuary, and then uh, the allowable catch, everything going to be this one. And this is new thing, been introduced since 2020. And when we talk about the geographical fish diversity in Indonesia, we have like a 1,200 species on it. The number of species mostly in the Sunda land. So there are three John and this is uh, completely different between one zone and another zone. Even though Wallace John and South Land is kind of different, it's kind of uh, less species compared to Sundaland, but the endemicity is quite high. It's almost 60, 70% of species living there is endemic. And the Saho Land is quite similar with the Australian uh, fish species. And when it's come to the biodiversity, of course, Indonesia has uh, the second highest biodiversity in the world, luck behind the, the Brazil Amazon. But then, when we compare about the genetic diversity, in the Amazon, they have one integrated system. But in Indonesia, we have like island to island island. Even the same species in the Sumatra Island, they have a different genetic compared to the one found in the Borneo. So, the Indonesia hosts the world's highest density of species. And one of the most interesting species in Indonesia is the Rasporini. It's comprised more than 30 species, and if you can see the, the picture, it's really amazing. And we try to depict uh, the species boundary and the uh, geographical of the species. And these all the species, uh, some uh, important species in the Sunda land, Saho land, Wallace, and ornamental species. If you can see, it's, it's completely different species. Conflicts in different species, different shape among these three uh, area. Some concern and problem. The, now I'm pointing out uh, that there are two uh, constraints and problem. One is the invasive species, and the other one is degradation of the water quality. This is becoming immense uh, because we have one particular ecosystem, it's a peatland, and one, the government build dam, uh, build reservoir, and this is going to drain the, uh, the peatland, and then we're going to lose this uh, peatland. Peatland, fish from peatland, is very interesting because this is ancient ecosystem. And Indonesia hosts like uh, more than 62% of the world known tropical peatland. And fish living in the peatland is amazing because this kind of uh, um, like a laboratory to adapt to the climate change. Uh, this is like a harsh environment. Fish living there can adapt to low uh, pH, low oxygen, and high concentration of metal. But then, not only the adults can survive, but also the, the larvae, the juveniles. So we, we found at least uh, 11 in the South Sumatra, in the Sumatra, uh, Sumatra Island. They complete all the life history in the pitland. So it's quite amazing how 
a tiny individual can cope with this uh, harsh environment. And even uh, there are many more to be discovered. We found uh, two new species from the bitland. Not only the species, but the, the whole genus live only in Indonesia, the genus uh, Pectonocypris. The species is quite interesting because they have a gear record more than 200 species. And this is the only species in a cyprin which have this one. And also we uh, sequenced the, the, the complete uh, mitochondrial genome and it's, and it's definitely a uh, different species. So now we are uh, going to the, the eastern part of Indonesia, which is Papua New Guinea. We already mentioned about this. And interestingly, still in the pitland, uh, the, they complete the life history in the pitland. We, 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 we find like 30 species on it. And also, uh, there are biodiversity ways to be characterized. And from all sequence that we, we did, 68, we cannot find uh, the match in the gene bank or other uh, public domain. But the really interesting uh, environment in Papua with a pristine area, with all the, the, the kind of uh, uh, interesting stuff. This is all the freshwater fish living in the Kumbe River. So this is a bit in the south part of the South Papua. And then I, I did the research on a, in the northern part of the Papua, in the middle of the Membramo River. Membramo River is the longest river in the Papua Island. This now is unblocked river. So it's really interesting to study the, the ecologies of some species on it. But now there is a discussion about to build dam for hydropower electric. So uh, it's going to be uh, very challenging in the future. So we found in the middle, at least 68% of the total biomass is in passive. So the passive species is really, really challenging for us now. So uh, the, the government has uh, some kind of program, we call it transmigration, we move people from Java Island to the Papua Island. While they are moving, they bring also the pet, including the, the, the fish, and then they breed them. And some fish, they, they manage to escape from the wild. And also the habitat issue is about the connectivity. Because of the scarcity about the effectiveness of the fish passage in Indonesia and uh, the importance of the fish passage, only two being built in Indonesia. One is the uh, Perjaya Dam. But since the installment in 1991 until now, at least 55 species already disappeared because there are some flaws of the design, including the entrance, the internal buffer, the fish exit. So this is the thing that only adopt from the, the Northern Hemisphere, not the local condition. You see all the fish in the Projaya Dam and also the challenge balancing, so in building the dam in another way, but also uh, maximize the, uh, the fisheries resource. And that the, in the end, with the, uh, giving a benefit to the ag agriculture through the dam with a good balance we, we also can uh, contribute to the advantage of the fish biodiversity, social, economic and uh, inland visitors for the people. Thank you Lee, that's all from me and I wait for the question, thank you. Thank you, Arif. Uh, yeah, we do have two minutes uh, for some questions. It's certainly an interesting part of the world. I mean, is it over 1,700 islands makes up uh, Indonesia and New Guinea? It's, uh, it's amazing. Uh, so, Nicole, any questions? And be sure to unmute yourself. Yeah. Yeah, I accidentally remuted myself. Okay, so <laughs> our first question is, with Borneo being the largest inland water source, how is the deforestation, peat fires, and encroaching and increase of palm oil plantations impacting this island's fresh water? Are there groups there that, that uh, global community members could follow or support that you know of or recommend? Yes, uh, it's really interesting in the Borneo. Borneo always interesting part of Indonesia. 
because there are a huge uh, amount of uh, freshwater fish living there. Yes, indeed, there is uh, deforestation in, in the Bor Borneo uh, last, I mean, uh, few years back because the Indonesia has a policy to convert the, the forest to becoming the paddy plantation around like 1 million hectare. But it seems like the, the project is unsuccessful. But during the project, there are many deforestation. Now the government really re realized about this and uh, there are many uh, like uh, organi NGO or, or, or bilateral agreement between Indonesia and, and other country to try to save uh, the, the remaining forests. Because, you know, the peatland is, is very unique, very interesting. The one that now in the peatland is already like an ancient, is already there for many years. So when, when deforestation happen, it's open, and then uh, when the dry season, all the, what you call, uh, the, the land is burning. And, and when it's burning, we try to stop the fire in the surface. It's, it's not going to be ha happen because the fire is going to go under. And the thickness of this uh, pit is about like 15 meters or 10 meters. So this is many. But there are many in, uh, going initiative uh, in, in the Borneo Island to save the forest and to, uh, to preserve the biodiversity. Thank you. Thank you, Arif. Um, Look, that brings us to the end of the Q&A session for the, uh, for the Indonesian section, but we do have 15 minutes now for a wrap up and further questions. And so there's so many questions that were dismissed because we ran out of time, but now we have 15 minutes, Nicole, to try and revisit some of those questions. So, uh, so we can either keep going with questions from Arif or throw it open to other, other presenters. So if, if anyone has a really burning question that hasn't been addressed, please post it now into the Q&A and uh, we'll have 15 minutes to try and get to them. So, uh, Nicole, uh, over to you with the question. So, it's been great to see so much interaction from everyone. It's been really fantastic, so. Yeah, we love seeing all these questions. I'm sorry I had to dismiss so many. They were really great. Um, so, let's see, one question that I highlighted that um, seemed great was, um, how does how is climate change impacting fish migration due to water quality and sediments and storages? Um, I believe that was from the first presentation, but I also feel like a lot of our speakers could answer that. So, where, which... Yeah, I mean, is that, would anyone like to try that one? So, is that, is that in the question window now, or is that in the dismissed, Nicole? It's uh, one of the dismissed questions, but I saved it on another screen to ask later. Yeah, okay. Um, would you mind posing it again? And we, we'll see, oh, Martin, Martin looks like he's unmuted himself. So Martin, okay. do you want to have a go at that question? Oh, look, I, I, I'll have one go at it because I, I have uh, a, a different perspective on it. Uh, climate change, you've seen in the last 12 months, has had a massive uh, impact on Australia in terms of bushfires. We've also had in the last 20 years, uh, an ex in, in, certainly in South Eastern Australia, an extraordinarily dry period of inflows. It's not beyond the sort of 130 year record, but it is pretty unusual. So we've had these long periods, as I you know, described in my talk, of zero flows. And a lot of the discussion becomes around uh, climate change and drought, but fundamentally that actually exaggerates some impacts. So in that case, as, as I showed, we have dams that, that are holding back water. In, in that case, in that period of zero flow, 100,000 megalitres was held by the dams, another 10,000 meg was held by the town water supplies. So the bigger impact, surprisingly, in this case, in terms of flow, is actually you know, storage and re-regulation of flow. Then, when, when there's a drought, climate change just exaggerates all those things. And um, so it's a, it's a more complex picture. Thanks, Martin. Good perspective. Oh, we have a few other ones here, Nicole, so we might try and see if we can get through as many as we can. Definitely. Um, so there's one here for Sean, and it says, what is the assessment process for barriers in New Zealand? Um, so that is the new um, fish passage assessment tool. Um, so it's a citizen science app. 
so anyone can um, do it and basically it takes from five minutes to 15 20 minutes depending on the type of structure so if you've got a multi-barreled culvert um, it's going to take longer because you have to take measurements per culvert um, but it basically takes you through a bunch of questions you then submit um, that assessment and then it actually um, processes overnight and links with those Bayesian belief networks so information we've um, tested through um, experts and knowledge of what fish can do and then it comes up with a risk to fish passage um, on the page and it color codes it which was on my last slide there was a little picture and um, so then you can go in onto the web interface um, and kind of click on it and it gives you a risk to fish passage and then a priority to fix so it kind of looks at all the um, different structure assessments within the catchment so this is all brand new um, in the last year so it's um, Definitely, we had to do a bit of fixing um, about six months ago, but it's been really working great um, in the last six months. And we're just currently, by June, um, adding in the national layer and translating all the previous regional fish passage assessments into the new format. And I noticed Christina has just posted the link to that in the chat window. So if anyone wants to have Ooh, a look, go, feel Christina. free to, to <laughs> log on. <laughs> so wonderful interaction there. Thanks for the answers, Jan. Uh, any more, Nicole? We have, we have another four or five minutes um, where oh, we can great. keep moving through the questions. Yeah, we have several more. Uh, here's an interesting one. It says, is plastic pollution an issue in fisheries management at this point? I think I anybody. I can might throw. This. I might throw that one to uh, to Arif because uh, plastic is a big issue in Indonesia. Arif, would you like to offer a perspective on on plastic in the rivers of Indonesia? Yes, yeah, Ali. Now it's becoming huge uh, attention from the government about the, the the plastic in the in the river of Indonesia. There are several programs now happening. We are trying to accumulate how, how many uh, how plastic now scattered in all around Indonesia River first. The second, now the government uh, in, in every store in, in, in the big city, they, they prohibit to use the plastic bag, uh, some kind of like a campaign for this one. And also the government launched any uh, initiative to recycle the, the plastic, the plastic, they, they're trying to like, a, some special group collect uh, the plastic from the s 2 r system and then going to the factory to recycle this one. So this is becoming very interesting because, you know, the Indonesia is the second largest uh, plastic producer in the world after China. Wow. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Arif. Amazing perspective there. Um, look, I think we have time for one more, Nicole. One more to round out our session. Great. Um, I think this is a good last question. It says, what about garnering public support for removing or retrofitting fish barriers? Public support. Who would like to tackle that question about getting the public on board to help uh, restore swimways? I'll jump in here, Lee. So it's Matt Thanks, here. Matt. Um, look, uh, it, it's critical. And uh, to be frank, from, from at least in New South Wales, we haven't done a good enough job of engaging with the public, um, not just the recreational fishers, um, but it's something that is on our, uh, one of our, our top priorities is that we now have a strategy. We need to let people know about that strategy. What we found is that when we actually did um, go out and, and do some market testing around fishways and whether people would support fish passage, they overwhelmingly supported that to the point where when they tried to value um, how beneficial fishways were, they actually tripled the cost of the, the act, what it actually cost to build a fishway versus what they perceived the benefit would be in dollar value. So our experience from that going through that assessment is that the community really does support it. We just need to do a better job of getting it out there amongst those community members um, so that they can engage with the process a bit more. 
Thanks very much, Matt. And uh, I think that brings us to the end of the Oceania session. And uh, as a moderator, I'd sincerely like to thank all of the speakers for putting the time and effort into their presentations. Absolutely wonderful. Uh, moving from New Zealand through Australia and to finish in Indonesia segues us really nicely into the East Asian session, which is coming up next. And, and would really like to thank the organisers. I mean, what a, what a wonderful, uh, I mean, logistical feat to, to get everyone around the world talking about swimways and fish. It's just the one. So thanks, Nicole. Thanks, Aya. And thanks to you. Yeah, thanks to everyone who's been online uh, in the back, or Ruben as well, in the background, just making sure this runs smoothly. Um, no glitches. We got through the Oceania session uh, really well. So thanks to everyone. Uh, thanks to particularly to everyone who dialed in. We, we averaged almost 200 people uh, per talk there. So it was a wonderful start to this Global Fishways Marathon and uh, hope to see you all at the end in, uh, in 22 hours time. So with that, I will hand over to Ayan, uh, who, will, who will segue into the East Asia program. So thanks again, everyone. Yes, it was wonderful yes. having you online. Wow, I'm, I'm really impressed. And, and thank you so much, Lee, for this excellent way that you uh, moderated this. And I've, I've been really very inspired by the different talks. Um, and, and I was actually amazed how things are quite similar to, for example, for Europe. So that's really nice, uh, nice to see. There's really too, too, a lot to exchange and to learn there. And, and um, I like very much the quote uh, of Jan saying that the tuna is our guardian, but we are also the guardian for the tuna. We have a responsibility now. I thought that was really, really, really nice. Um, I would like to share something uh, very shortly. Um, I mean, for, first of all, it's really, really, really impressive uh, what, what the, uh, the guys have been talking. And it's so nice that we uh, have been able to do this uh, uh, together. And um, I just would like to thank also the, the sponsors of our uh, team that we could do this. Oh, that's a little bit too fast. Because without them, we could not do this. They are supporting us also for World Fish Migration Day. That's on the 24th of October. So I really hope to see many of you also there. Um, it's a really, really nice uh, adventure that we globally can do together, reaching out to people, as we were just saying um, before, um, it's important to, to convince also other peoples that migratory fish matter. Um, yes, I think what we have been doing uh, hopefully supports to the 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 well-being of the migratory fish worldwide and in the end also for ourselves i would like to close with a little song you might know in uh, in europe we have a eurovision song festival that would have been on the 16th of november uh, of uh, of may uh, but because of the COVID situation that has been uh, 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 well it, it's not going on but we uh, thought of an idea to have a eurovision Song Festival. And uh, from the 16th of May, it is possible to vote for songs that have been sent to us. These uh, uh, songs are about fish, migratory fish. And I'd like to share with you uh, one of the songs as a closure of this fantastic session. It's actually a song that has been made by Ruben, who is one of the hosts at the moment. And um, I hope you can uh, hear this well. Um, one moment, I will make sure that the sound is good. So I will share it again, optimizing the sound. And there we go. I hope you can hear it. If not, I'll hear it from you, uh, Lee. Here we go. Ruben, I hope you enjoy watching yourself as well. Uh, there we go. When I migrate, yeah, I know I'm gonna be, I'm gonna be the fish that migrates next to you. When I swim up, yeah, I know I'm gonna be, I'm gonna be the fish that swims along with you. When I get caught, Yes, I know I'm gonna be, I'm gonna be the fish that gets caught next to you. And if the river, yes, the river route is cut, I'm gonna be the fish that's dying without you. 
That was so nice. Thank you, Ruben. Okay, we have a break and we want to wait for the next session very soon from East Asia. Looking forward. Thank you.